Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 709 for June 24th, 2018. Coming up in just a few minutes. Let's face it, we're drinking liquid history here. This is something that's not going to happen every day. The thing is with all of these, when they're gone, they're gone. You know, you can't put something back in the barrel and for 45 years, there will be something new. Somebody else will do that, and, and I'm sure beat this record. At, uh, you know, bourbon has been in the barrel for longer than any other, but uh, it'll probably be 46 years before that happens, I would guess. <laughs> Thursday night, I was at Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts for a taste of history. The chance to taste two of the oldest bourbons ever bottled. The 45 and 42-year-old James Thompson and brother final reserve bourbons, along with three other vintage Kentucky whiskeys. That story is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice behind the label, and in the what I'm tasting this week department, well, you've probably already figured that out. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Cleanup work should get underway this week at Sazerac's Barton 1792 Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky, following Friday's partial collapse of a rickhouse that left a heap of splintered lumber, twisted sheet metal, and around 9,000 barrels of maturing whiskey and other spirits. Investigators are still trying to figure out what caused the collapse, No one was inside the warehouse at the time, and no one apparently saw what happened. According to the Nelson County Gazette, someone driving along Old Boston Road at the back end of the property saw the aftermath of the collapse and called authorities. Jim Brooks is the Gazette's editor. He grew up in the neighborhood near that warehouse and went to the scene right after the collapse. They wouldn't let us back directly to the site, so... uh... I, I was getting uh, photos fed to me from uh, first responders, uh, firefighters who were who were there, and uh, basically, uh, it just looked like uh, if you've seen the pictures, the uh, half of the warehouse just simply kind of just collapsed straight down and out at the bottom, of course, and leaving the other half. And it was right in the middle where the separation was, where the warehouse just collapsed, and uh, uh, of course. Um, Um, you know, the, the, it it looks to me, two halves of the roof are still in place over much of the, uh, the debris from the collapse and the, the walls on each end just kind of pushed laid over on each end. So we were speculating that it was kind of a slower collapse. It wasn't a, you know, a tremendous, um, you know, rushed, uh, draw everything just kind of fell in a hurry. We, we speculation is it just kind of all settled down and laid it all half of the building just laid down and if it had gone down faster it probably would have made a lot more noise and somebody would have noticed it right well that particular warehouse is on the uh at the far end of their um, property and not very well populated and i don't know that uh, it would have been that noticeable um though you would think it would if it had been a huge uh, rumble i'm sure um uh, of the neighborhood where I grew up in there, uh, there were, there, there were uh, a number of houses um, that I, you can actually see this particular warehouse from. So I would think that if nothing else, it would have shaken the ground, if not made a, you know, a huge rumble when it, when it collapsed. Barton 1792 was shut down for maintenance this past week. Right. And I understand that uh, according to the fire chief out there, they had expressed some concerns about that warehouse, hadn't they? Yes, the fire chief said that there had been some issues uh, related to the, uh, my impression was the structural integrity of uh, a portion of that of that warehouse, and they had been looking at it 
and maybe even working on it, and that, but no one was was present when they during the collapse. Do you know how often they inspect those warehouses? Uh, I know you've grown up out there and been following this industry for a long time. How often do those places get inspected? I'm not sure how often they're inspected, but the uh, these warehouses uh, probably date back to uh, um, either immediately. Uh, probably, I, I'm, my guess is right after Prohibition. Uh, so these warehouses have been in, in place for quite some time. Uh, the a collapse of a uh, rick house is is uh, I can I can't remember one ever happening like this in the past. Um, this one was on the far edge of their their group of uh, warehouses, um, um, and you know perhaps there was a structural issue. I don't know, but since rick houses by design are self supporting. I'm not sure what you, uh, you know, what sort of issues they were having, or or how you would, um, um, how would you how you would address those as, you know, as in the guy because I'm not an engineer. And we know that with this rickhouse construction, the walls are not load bearing for the actual barrels. The ricks are self supporting. Right. So for something like this to happen, it had to have been the ricks collapsing. It wasn't the walls blowing out. It's the ricks collapsing, and took the walls out with it. I would do. So, I would expect that's what we're going to find when. Uh, the engineers get done investigating. Right. Uh, where I live now is within sight of uh, where Heaven Hill Distilleries is building their uh, their uh, barrel preserve, they call it. And uh, uh, when you watch these rickhouses being built, they are self-supporting from the inside, and the exterior is simply just sheathing to to uh, to make everything weather tight. Tell me what it smelled like. Uh, it was just just a. Uh, uh, well, of course, as I said, Arsene usually smells like bourbon in some part of the manufacturing. Um, there was uh, just some, uh, just an enhanced smell of uh, of uh, bourbon you um, uh, near the site, and not it wasn't that strong, uh, maybe because I wasn't particularly downwind from the site. But uh, um, obviously, the concern was um, that the barrels on the bottom uh, that may have been broken or were leaking. And I think that uh, that's been confirmed that there's been some leakage from the site. But it hasn't reached the uh, creek down at the bottom of the hill, has it? Well, according to the latest uh, reports I have is that, yes, there's been some uh, some leakage that uh, early on and after the collapse, it, some alcohol did get into the creek. Uh, and uh, there's been some uh, reports of fish being killed in the creek. I don't know how extensive that is, but uh, they did get a, uh, a retaining basin dug uh, fairly quickly and a retaining dike and, uh, to try to keep any more out of the creek. But, uh, um, of course, uh, um, they, you know, the early on, they, they weren't able to get the equipment in yet. And I would imagine they're being really careful with all this because they don't want that other half of that warehouse. If there's anything similar on that side, they don't want it coming down either. Well, that's right. I, there's no estimate on how structurally sound the other half of that warehouse is. And uh, and uh, one thing that did fall with the first part was the elevator. Uh, each each warehouse at one end will have a service elevator for hauling the barrels up and down to the various levels. And that, that part collapsed as well. So there's really no way to, uh, right now, to access the upper stories of the uh, part that's remaining. And I, and I think they're probably looking at how they handle the part that's collapsed and if moving any of that is going to affect the integrity of, of their remaining uh, half of the warehouse. That's Nelson County Gazette editor Jim Brooks. Sazerac executives have declined all interview requests since Friday, but said in a statement that it may be days or weeks before they know what caused the collapse and before they know how many barrels can be recovered. We'll have more details on this story as they're available, and later in this episode, we'll explain the origins of the Rickhouse on Behind the Label. In other news, if you've ever wanted to buy a historic Scotch whiskey distillery, time to call your banker. Edrington plans to sell its Glen Turret distillery and single malt brand in Scotland, along with the Cuddy Sark blended Scotch whiskey brand. ScotchWhiskey.com first reported the story on Friday, noting that Edrington wants to focus on its premium portfolio, which includes the McAllen, Highland Park, the Glenrothes, and the famous Grouse blend. 
Glen Turret is one of Scotland's oldest distilleries, and its whiskey is a key component in many of the famous grouse expressions. The distillery itself is the site of the famous grouse experience. Edrington plans to close that center after the distillery is sold, and a company spokesman says a new famous grouse visitor experience may be developed in the future. Edrington acquired Cuddy Sark in 2010 as part of a deal with Berry Brothers and Rudd that also included the Glenrothes Single Malt. Berry Brothers and Rudd held on to the Glenrothes Distillery until selling it to Edrington last year. The company expects, quote, a high level of interest in both brands. So far, the whiskey trade war appears to be a one-sided battle. The European Union's 25% tariff on imported American whiskeys went into effect on Friday. There's been no response yet from the Trump administration on any retaliatory moves against European whiskeys, though the administration appears to be considering tariffs on imported cars from Europe right now. Canada's 10% tariff on American whiskeys will go into effect this coming Sunday on July 1st, while China's 25% tariff takes effect on July 6th. Turkey also slapped a 40% tariff on American whiskey imports Thursday. All of those tariffs are in retaliation for the U.S. tariffs on imported steel and aluminum that the Trump administration says are necessary on national security grounds. It should be noted that Turkey is not a major export market for American-made whiskies, and President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has tried to discourage alcohol consumption in his predominantly Muslim country. In other business news, back in February of last year, during episode 628, we reported on the launch of the Whiskey and Spirits Exchange Traded Fund. Exchange traded funds are similar to mutual funds, and this one was created to invest in stocks of publicly traded whiskey companies around the world. The fund traded under the ticker symbol WSKY, and we use the word traded in the correct past tense. Spirited Funds, which created the fund and its accompanying stock index, along with the ETF Managers Group, has closed the fund and is liquidating its assets to shareholders. We have reached out via email to Spirited Funds CEO David Bolton to find out why the fund was closed and whether shareholders lost any money on their investments. As of June 15th, when the fund officially closed, it had around $14.6 million in assets, but had lost 2.8% of its market value through the first five months of 2018. At the time, Diageo was its biggest holding at 17% of the fund, followed by Pernod Ricard, MGP Ingredients, Brown Foreman, Remy Cointreau, and LVMH Moet Hennessy. We'll have more details on this story as they become available. Canada's Corby Spirits and Wine is making a major change in its U.S. distribution for its northern border collection of Canadian whiskies. It's switching importers from Pernod Ricard USA to San Francisco-based Hodling & Company. The deal includes Lot 40, Pike Creek, and Gooderham & Wirtz whiskies. It does not include Corby's flagship J.P. Weiser's Canadian whiskey. In a news release, Corby CEO Patrick O'Driscoll cited Hodling's experience with distributing craft spirits in the U.S. What makes this deal a bit unusual? Corby is part of Pernod Ricard, though its shares are separately traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Meanwhile, there are two new J.P. Weiser's expressions out in Canada, and one of them has a special meaning for Canada Day this coming weekend. While 2017 marked the 150th anniversary of Canada's Confederation, 2018 marks the 200th anniversary of the treaty that settled border disputes between the British and the U.S. following the War of 1812. That agreement set the 49th parallel as the border from Lake of the Woods in Minnesota and Manitoba all the way to the Rocky Mountains, and was eventually extended all the way to Point Roberts on the British Columbia coast. The Weiser's Canada 2018 Commemorative Series Whiskey is bottled at 43.4% ABV, 
and will sell for around $50 Canadian a bottle, depending on the province. There's also an Ontario exclusive from Weiser's that will only be available at the LCBO stores in Ontario. J.P. Weiser's seasoned oak uses barrels that were air-seasoned for 48 months, and the whiskey inside was matured for 19 years. It's bottled at 48% ABV and will sell at the LCBO for $99.95 Canadian a bottle. Working our way south, New York's Copper Sea Distilling will be releasing a new bottled-in-bond version of its Bontecou Crag Straight Rye. The original version is matured for two years, while this version gets the full four years required for bottled-in-bond whiskeys. It'll debut at the distillery's release party this coming Sunday, July 1st, in New Paltz, New York. And I'll have tasting notes for it soon at WhiskeyCast.com. In our Your Voice segment last time around, we mentioned the joy that some people felt after getting their hands on a bottle of the Redbreast Dream Cask, which went on sale several weeks ago online through the Redbreast website, to members of the Birdhouse, Redbreast's online members club. However, the complaints started almost as soon as the bottles started arriving and showing up for sale online. According to some social media posts, someone was able to get 40 bottles out of the 816 that went on sale. And there was a lot of criticism of Irish distillers for not limiting the number of bottles a single person could purchase as was done several years ago with the Manoa Lerve limited edition release. I checked with Irish distillers after hearing those complaints and heard back via email from Irish distillers spokeswoman Aoife Keane this weekend. Their plan going into the Dreamcast sale was to limit sales to two per person, but a glitch in the online shop's software removed that limit and allowed for multiple purchases. Site administrators didn't find out about that glitch until after Dreamcast had sold out, and there was no way to go back and cancel confirmed orders. Steps will be taken to make sure the problem is not repeated with birdhouse releases in the future. And finally, let's correct a couple of stories from the last episode. In our story on East Side Distilling's new American Single Malt from Oregon, I described it as coming from the Black Bottom Distillery Eastside acquired last year. I meant to say Big Bottom Distilling, got it confused with Black Button Distilling in Rochester, New York. Also, I reported that New Rift Distilling in Newport, Kentucky, will be launching its debut four-year-old bottled and bond bourbon this coming weekend at a release party. That party is actually scheduled for July 31st, and the bourbon itself will go on sale at retailers this fall. We regret the errors. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking soul. Summer's here at last, and so is the light. Highland Park's second release in its Solstice series is now available in the United States. For a limited time, if you order The Light or any other Highland Park whiskey at ReserveBar.com, use the promo code ORCADIA to get free shipping. You can check out the entire lineup at HighlandParkWhiskey.com. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events. The Aaron Malt and Music Festival is this coming weekend from June 29th through July 1st in La Cranza, Scotland. Sweden's Box, soon to be High Coast Distillery, has its annual whiskey festival on the 30th and 31st in Adalen, Sweden. Buffalo Trace Distillery hosts the annual Great Buffalo Chase 5K Run on Independence Day, July 4th in Frankfurt, Kentucky. Tales of the Cocktail is coming up July 17th through the 22nd in New Orleans. Moonshine University in Louisville, Kentucky has a one-day bourbon-making workshop at the Distilled Spirits Epicenter on July 20th. Specs Wines in Houston, Texas has a compass box tasting at its Smith Street store on July 26th. Whiskey Live Perth is on the 27th and 28th in Perth, Australia. And Mike Veach's next bourbon salon at Oxmoor Farm in Louisville 
features Women Distillers August 1st. Right now, we have 197 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a tasting, festival, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form on our website and let us know all about it. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. Aging in oak for 12 long years. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Back at the start of 2018, we met James Buddy Thompson in episode 674. His family owned the old Glenmore Distillery in Owensboro, Kentucky for decades until he sold it to Guinness in 1991. But Buddy Thompson held on to a few barrels of bourbon that he and his family bought for their own personal use. In about 1970, uh, we had produced some, some bourbon, which uh, we considered to be our finest, uh, finest bourbon, oldest recipe and all. And we set aside a few barrels thinking someday we'd like to do a commemorative bottling, maybe at the millennium or some particular anniversary. We weren't sure what, but just thought it would be nice to have some available. And uh, that became this product, uh, which after 45 years, we decided was old enough and ready to bottle. That's right. The oldest was 45 years in the barrel. That makes it the oldest bourbon ever bottled, along with a few barrels of slightly younger whiskey that he held on to. Thompson worked with Louisville's Fraser History Museum, and that 45-year-old bourbon went on sale March 1st for $1,800 a bottle, with all proceeds from the sale going to veterans' charities. People lined up around the block at the Fraser to get their hands on one of the fewer than 200 bottles of James Thompson and Brother Final Reserve, and it sold out immediately. Earlier this month, the Fraser put two more batches of Final Reserve on sale, 44 years old and 42 years old. The 44-year-old sold out within an hour, while the museum's Andy Trinan says there is still some of that 42-year-old left. We uh, have exactly, and we watched them closely, 48 left. Uh, you can go to FraserMuseum.org if you're interested in getting one of those. Uh, and we will uh, find a way to get it to you if you're in another part of the country. And that's what led up to a special tasting Thursday night at Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts. You see, Julio's owner, Ryan Maloney, bought one of those 45-year-old bottles and a 42-year-old. Andy Trinan flew with those bottles from Louisville to Boston, trusting almost $4,000 worth of whiskey to the mercies of checked baggage. And they didn't disappear. Risky business. Yeah, it was a risky yeah. business. Especially what airline? So I know which 115. one. 115. <laughs> he and checked both of these boxes in a suitcase. I put them in a big, hardbound Mickey Mouse suitcase uh, as to avoid <laughs> suspicion. Ryan didn't buy those bottles to flip them or even try to sell them at retail. Instead, he opened up his tasting room at the store in Boston's western suburbs. For $150 per person, anyone could taste two of the oldest bourbons ever bottled, along with three other vintage whiskeys from the 50s and 60s. And once again, the proceeds went to veterans' charities. It had to be done. It's one of those type of things. We, you've seen we've done that before with a lot of different products. And uh, we want our customers and the people that are in the Lock and Key Society, obviously, to have the, the breadth and width of what's available out there and get some neat experiences along the way. Joe Hyman of Boston's Skinner Auctions supplied the other three whiskeys, a Four Roses blended whiskey from the early 1960s, an eight-year-old, very old Fitzgerald weeded bourbon, 
distilled at the Stitzel Weller Distillery in Louisville in 1958 and bottled in 1966. Happy Van Winkle himself made this. And a direct relative to the two final reserve bourbons, a Kentucky Tavern bourbon distilled at Glenmore in 1952 and bottled in 1960 by the Thompson family. This is actually as, as, as interesting and, and, and historical as these are to, I don't like to try. I'm, I'm most excited to try this because this is the grandfather of those. This is the Kentucky Tavern. It was distilled in 1952, bottled in 1960 in the captain's decanter over there. Um, this was bought, produced by Glenmore, which is the parent company of the, the Thompson Reserve. Um, the Thompson Reserve was produced at, at the old Yellowstone Distillery, which um, was also in the family. Um, but this is pure Glenmore, eight year old. While about 30 people sipped those first three whiskeys in reverent near silence, the store's staff brought out the two final reserves. First, the 42-year-old. It was bottled at 57.5% ABV and had the color of old motor oil. On this stuff, tread lightly. It's, it's, it's like a cognac. It's, <laughs> it's got a very cognac-y nose, and it's like, oh, wow, this is great, and you're going to attempt it to like, throw it back. Don't do that. This stuff, they spend 42 years in the wood. And if you throw this back, then we're going to have to like get, get, get out the WD-40 to, to lubricate your throat. <laughs> just, just, just a warning. Look at the color. And it's, and it's, and it's uh, very high proof. It's um, 115. This is 115. The next one's 120. So, uh, but, and and it just, just take a sip initially and use your water bottle to add water to it because it really opens up the more water you add to it and it, and it tones down that dryness and it tones down the, that woodiness and, and it helps, helps the whiskey really open up. And finally, the 45-year-old, still intense and powerful at 60% ABV. You're going to get a lot of wood. There's no way around it. You yeah. put something in a barrel for that many years, especially new charred oak, you're going to get wood. A little water opened up both whiskeys and the opinions of those tasting them. Before tonight, what's the oldest bourbon you'd ever tasted? Uh, uh, probably um, the Pepe 25. What'd you think, Dave? Uh, I was definitely surprised by the 42, how good it was, considering it's 42 years old. The 45 was what I expected. Um, dry sawdust, uh, old shoe leather, uh, dirty uh, ashtray in the 45. 42. I was surprised. Now, both of these whiskeys are older than you are, right? Yeah, by far, yes. Yeah. What would you think of them? They were a bit astringent. They were, they were tough. They were really tough. I, I like some of the other ones a lot more. They, they were rough. But uh, still a once-in-a-lifetime experience, right? Oh, yeah, it was definitely worth it. I'm, this is the only place you can try stuff like that. I mean, other than being rich, for sure. This is, it was a great experience. I was very happy with trying it. Strong, absolutely needed water to really be palatable. Uh, but it was very interesting to taste the flavors you get. Like I, he said, it. I was kind of expecting it to be like an oak sandwich, you know, just 40 years, 42, 45 years in a barrel. You know, I figured you just taste wood. But there are actually some interesting flavors in there, especially after I added some water to it, really diluted it down, and it really brought out the flavors. It brought down that astringency factor that it had, both being very high proof, 115 and 120. Uh, so it really brought it down to a palatable taste. I appreciated the opportunity to try all of them. Um, I like bourbon. I'm more of a novice when it comes to it. Um, you know, my favorite was probably the Four Roses, if I had to pick one out of all of them. Um, I thought that it was very interesting, and you could actually, for the first time, you really, for me, I could, you know, smell the difference and, you know, really start to identify some of those flavors for some of the older bourbons, which was very, very cool for me. You know, I, the, the oak, the strong oak is definitely something that's new for me to, to try to uh, appreciate, I'll say. <laughs> but you can't, you can't under, you can't underscore the, the history that we got to try, which is very cool. I was very appreciative of, of the ability to try them. Um, honestly, I, I enjoyed the 
older, meaning the, the ones from the 60s and 70s that were bottled in the 60s and 70s, more so than the, the oldest in the barrel ones. Um, but it was, it was an incredible experience to try them um, and, and to really see, you know, for, for the oldest ones, kind of, you definitely got the wood and, and all that stuff, but to see what, you know, the, uh, the 60s and 70s tasted like was really a, a special treat as well. Ryan Maloney paid full price for both bottles, yet he resisted the urge to open them up himself first. Actually, the 42-year-old sort of surprised me in its depth of the, of the flavor of the whiskeys that was really coming out. I expected it to be just basically more like, you know, chewing on a, 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 a church pew. But it definitely, had some, it definitely had some depth to it. The 45-year-old, obviously, if you can't taste wood in that, you don't know what wood tastes like. But it, it, it had, a, once again, was it my favorite whiskey I've ever had? No. But I think it's really important to sort of see what whiskey is like, especially bourbon, after 45 years. And just to even get that experience. And it's, let's face it, we're drinking liquid history here. This is something that's not going to happen every day. And you didn't sample these beforehand. You tasted them tonight with all of us, didn't you? I did. You saw me open up the bottles. They were unsealed. I, trust me, we were tempted. But uh, uh, Andy brought them down, and we figured that uh, we would get the same experience along with everybody else that was here tonight. Remember when I said the 45-year-old Final Reserve bottles sold out immediately? Well, that's not exactly the case. You see, four of them will go on the auction block this Tuesday night at Skinner's in Boston as part of its sale of rare bourbons and other whiskeys. They were donated back by one of the benefactors who bought several of them and donated them back to the, to, to the Fraser Museum in order for them to use as a fundraising item and uh, they, they put four of them up for, for auction to see what the value is on these because they, they went out at, at a much lower value than, than was expected and, and they sold out immediately. So now we're going to see what the, uh, what the residual value is on them several months later. What do you think it's going to be? Um, I've got it four to 5,000 uh, estimates on, on each set. Um, I think it should go a little bit higher than that. I mean, six to eight is not unreasonable, but it's the auction business. We'll see what, we'll see what happens. While the Fraser received a portion of the proceeds from the original sales, the museum will receive 100% of the proceeds from Tuesday night's auction, which it'll plow right back into its educational programs, including the new Spirit of Kentucky exhibition on bourbon history that will open up in August. Full disclosure, I was invited to attend the tasting as a member of the media, but covered all of my own expenses to make the trip to Massachusetts for the evening. And that's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the classic 16 year old, the distiller's edition, and the throwback 8 year old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, and there's no way that I'm going to taste whiskeys that old and that rare and not share my tasting notes with you. But let's start off with a couple of the vintage bottlings from that night first. The very old Fitzgerald bottling is unique in that it was produced for the German market and bottled at 43% ABV. Back then, very old Fitz was sold in the U.S. as bottled in bond bourbon at 50% ABV. The nose on this one is light and dry with notes of wheat bread, caramel corn, and malted milk candy balls. The taste starts off soft and slow to develop with sweet notes of caramel and maple, followed by a touch of white pepper spiciness and hints of vanilla and honey. The finish, long and gentle. 52 years after it went on the market, I'm scoring this edition a very old Fitzgerald, a 92. The Kentucky Tavern we tasted was a bottled and bond bourbon distilled at Glenmore in the spring season of 1952 and bottled in the fall of 1960 at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of caramel cola, soft spices, brown sugar, molasses, and just a touch of oak. The taste is full of flavor with great spices, oak shavings, honey, vanilla, caramel, and molasses. The finish is very long and full of flavor that fades away gently. I'm scoring this bottling of Kentucky Tavern a 95. 
both of these whiskies would hold their own against almost any bourbon made today. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, who is proud to announce a new grain-to-glass project where proprietary seed and unique mash bills re-examine the variables that go into making whiskey. See more at heavenhilldistillery.com slash blog. Think wisely, drink wisely. Now let's look at the James Thompson and Brother Final Reserve 42-Year-Old Bourbon. Once again, it's bottled at 57.5% ABV, and the nose is oaky, but not overly so, along with notes of licorice, molasses, figs, vanilla, and sawdust. The taste is oaky, dry, and chewy, with a lot of oak tannins, molasses, and soft spices. But water opens it up nicely and emphasizes those spices, along with a touch of mint. The finish is medium length, very dry, and oaky, but there are also touches of sandalwood, licorice, and anise hiding behind the oak. It's more complex than you might think at first taste. And I'm scoring the James Thompson and Brother Final Reserve 42-year-old bourbon a 92. Finally, the Final Reserve 45-year-old, it still packs a punch at 60% ABV. The nose, oak tannins, molasses, and muted spices. A bit more aromatic than the 42-year-old, but still very dry with touches of pipe tobacco and old leather book covers. The taste? Dry is not the word. Let's go for mouth-puckeringly astringent and woody with intense black pepper, toasted vanilla, hints of tobacco and leather, and a touch of cedar that can best be described as a wet cedar grilling plank for a salmon fillet. Water takes care of some of the astringency, while not wiping out the spices, and the finish is long, dry, and oaky, with lingering touches of spice. It's not the best bourbon I've ever had by a long shot, but it is a piece of bourbon history. I'm scoring the James Thompson and Brother Final Reserve 45-Year-Old Bourbon a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of 2,200 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo Edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. As you might expect, Friday's Rick House collapse at Barton 1792 Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky, generated a lot of comments, like this one from John Egan, Whiskey Cat 1324 in Ireland. Well-wishing sentiments are all good, of course, but I prefer positive action, to be honest. Mark and at Bourbon Patty maybe suggest some available distillery releases that we can support and are available on this side of the pond. Had to ask for some help on this one, because, to be honest, I'm generally not looking at the bourbon shelves when I'm at a whiskey shop in Europe, but several listeners noted that the 1792 bourbons are available in Europe, and you might come across a bottle of very old Barton if you're lucky. However, once it became clear that no one was hurt in the collapse, let's just say the hashtag too soon became quite popular. On Facebook from George Young in Indiana, something obviously went awry. Oy. From our friend Camper English at Alcademics on Twitter, on the work to keep whiskey from the warehouse away from a nearby creek, trying to keep the bourbon out of the branch. Of course, branch is another name for creek, as in bourbon and branch water and stuff like that there. From Mark at WTF at FR1Day on Twitter. 
Would it be fair to say the casks were rickrolled to the ground floor, along with the obligatory Rick Astley animated gif and the hashtag too soon? And from H. Hemphill at Bunkai H on Twitter, you shouldn't cry over spilled milk, but whiskey is another matter. Eric Barnes at Eric C. Barnes on Twitter asked this question the other day. Mark, Desert Island, you can only bring one bourbon with you. Which one do you bring? My answer, whatever I can grab off the drink cart as the plane is going down, and I hope I have enough time to get up to first class to grab the good stuff. That's why I try to avoid desert islands whenever possible. I don't like sand in my whiskey. Finally, although the last couple of minutes may have killed our chances, WhiskeyCast is one of the four finalists for Best Podcast, Online Video Series, or Radio Show in this year's Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards. It's the first time the Spirited Awards has given an award in this category, and we are very proud to be one of the finalists, along with Souther Teague's The Speakeasy, Bartender at Large, and Life Behind Bars, hosted by Noah Rothbaum and David Wondrich. Good luck to our colleagues, and the winner buys the first round after the awards ceremony next month in New Orleans, okay? If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com or track us down on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Behind the label is our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. And let's return to our top story of the week, the warehouse collapse at Barton's 1792 Distillery, Friday in Bardstown, Kentucky. Our web story on the collapse brought a few questions about the use of the terms Rick's and Rick House to describe the warehouse. In Kentucky, a rick is the term for the wooden framework that holds stacks of three barrels, and the term rick house comes from that. But where did the idea for storing barrels in ricks come from? I put the question to longtime bourbon historian and Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame member Mike Veach. Well, the term comes from the fact that in 18, I believe it's 1878, I'd have to go back and double check my records. Uh, my memory's not. 100% on that, but um, Frederick Stitzel patented uh, the system of racks for barrels for aging whiskey, and they started building the patent warehouses, as they call them. And uh, uh, I imagine that uh, the word Rick, there's a Kentuckyization of the word rack, and probably happened, you know, in 1879, after the <laughs> first Rick houses were built. And, of course, Stitzel is part of the Stitzel-Weller heritage, right? Right. He's one of the Stitzel brothers that founded the distillery, and it was one of their sons that was Arthur Philip Stitzel, who started a distillery that Van Winkle was buying uh, whiskey from in the early 20th century for W.L. Weller and Sons. And then during Prohibition, they pretty much merged. Didn't officially merge until after Prohibition when they built Stitzel Weller Distillery. So the first rack houses weren't built at Stitzel Weller then? No. Oh, no, no. It was probably built at the Stitzel Brothers Distillery. And where was that? Uh, 26 and Broadway here in Louisville. Now, in your experience, and you may not even know about this, how long do those things last before you have to take them apart? Do you have any idea? Uh, it depends. You know, uh, Stitzel Weller had one that they had to uh, tear down because of the termites <laughs> got into it. But others, you know, there's some pre-prohibition warehouses still out there, I believe. I'm not uh, 100% sure, but I think some of the 
uh, older ones. Well, I'll, uh, yeah, I do know one. Uh, the E. H. Taylor built one, and uh, it's now part of Castle and Key. <laughs> The rick houses being built all over Kentucky today are a lot larger than the one that collapsed on Friday. The new ones have a maximum capacity of around 50,000 barrels compared to the 18,000 barrels that the Barton 1792 warehouse held. But they're essentially built to the same design concept that the Barton 1792 warehouse and all of the other patent warehouses using Frederick Stitzel's original rack design used wooden racks that hold three stacked barrels with the ability to put one rack of barrels on top of another, and the walls don't bear any of the load of the whiskey. Once it became feasible to put elevators inside the warehouses, distilleries started building them taller and taller, in some cases up to nine stories tall. The Barton 1792 warehouse is seven stories high. So why wood for the ricks and not steel? If you've ever been inside a rickhouse and looked at the steel hoops on old barrels, you've seen the answer. Steel rusts, especially in humid conditions. The hardwood timbers used in building ricks don't rust, but they can be susceptible to rot and insect damage over time. There's also another very good reason for using wood instead of steel. Rickhouses or warehouses are very explosive environments because of the high concentration of alcohol vapors inside. If you're rolling a barrel into a steel rack, there's always a chance that one of the hoops on a barrel could brush up against the rack and cause a spark. Wooden racks eliminate that problem. If there's something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange, and our Whiskey Cast HD videos. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, events, my tasting notes, cocktail recipes, and much more, including a complete archive of past episodes. Our cast strength conversation continues all week long online. Look for us on Twitter. Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.